No, no, so vi this we think has <laughs> lots of data and you know, there's only so much oh, data here. Right? <laughs> right, right, exactly. <laughs> Um, <laughs> there are two ways to sketch, right? So, um, right, and this is, uh, this is useful for, generally, of course, we want properties of the sketch, so it is not just a pure compression. Uh, you can think about this as a functional compression. So it goes beyond just a compression limit. Uh, we are compressing with a certain uh, functionality purpose uh, in mind. Okay, <laughs> so usually what kind of objects are we compressing, you know, the data, oftentimes the data is just uh, a bunch of vectors uh, in high dimensional spaces, so let's say n objects, uh, and I'll give you an example where these uh, high dimensional objects come from, but also they can be matrices of graphs and so forth. Okay, and uh, the type of applications where the sketching really are helpful in uh, improving the computational times is uh, for similarity search. So I'll talk a little bit more about this application, but also in applications such as compress sensing or uh, more recently in uh, randomized numerical linear algebra, which have, are also uh, sped up using uh, sketching tools. Okay, and uh, I guess the classic notion of uh, uh, sketching is actually dimension reduction, uh, back from by Johnson Linus Strauss from '84, uh, which uh, you know, which is a theorem saying that we can project uh, a set of n-dimensional high-dimensional vectors into uh, into n vectors which have much lower dimension. Okay, so therefore every vector is represented uh, by much less information. Okay, and the type of sketch that this dim the dimension reduction preserves, uh, uh, sorry, the type of functionality that this sketch has is that it preserves the distances between points. Okay, you can imagine other properties you want to maintain, but for the purpose of this talk, this is what we'll be focusing on. Okay, and the general question, kind of you know, very vague question, is you know, to ask when is sketching possible? When can we uh, do, and what are the limits of sketching? Okay, so let me start in, uh, with the actual application. So the application is similarity search, or nearest number search, uh, where uh, you know, the typical problem is given a bunch of objects, and here the objects are, let's say, these images uh, of handwritten uh, digits. Uh, and you can think about you know, every image of 20 by 20 pixels can be represented, let's say, as 400 dimensional vector, where we have a coordinate per pixel. and uh, Generally, the, the, what similarity search is about is we want to pre-process a point set, like these blue points, which are obtained from these images, so that later we're given a query point Q, we find the closest point to it. Okay? So solving this exactly is hard, is, um, suffers from what is called curse of dimensionality, so usually we think about uh, approximation algorithms for this setting. Okay? So usually we model similarity as a, uh, as a certain kind of metric. Think about, let's say, Euclidean distance. Uh, and uh, if we can sketch these high dimensional vectors, uh, then this may speed up computation and allow indexing. So we'll see the example of indexing in a bit. Uh, and uh, the interesting metrics under which we want to solve nearest neighbor search include, I guess, the classic ones, Euclidean distance or Hamming distance. Uh, but also LP distances, let's say L infinity, and also you know, some slightly more specialized distances like eddy distance, which is eddy distance between strings uh, uh, or F mover distance. Okay, so uh, we'll return to some of these later. And uh, let me define kind of formally the problem, just, you know, and this is exactly the problem that we'll be talking about uh, today. Um, so. Uh, so we are sketching metrics, okay, for with the goal in mind of this similarity search. We have uh, three players, Alice and Bob and Charlie. Alice has a point X, let's say this is from a metric space. Uh, Bob uh, has Y from an, uh, another point in metric space. What we need to do is we need to sketch X and Y and think of sketch as uh, as S bit function. So a function that maps from the, from the metric space to an S bit, uh, to S bits. So we want to send this sketch to Charlie so that Charlie can solve oops, uh, the following decision problem, namely trans some algorithm, let's call it R, on these two sketches, and it outputs, uh, let's, uh, let's say, close if the distance is less than some threshold R, and it says far if the distance is more than approximation times R. 
Okay, so big D for us will be the approximation factor, which we think is bigger than one. Okay, so we need to distinguish between these. And we allow some randomness. This will be shared randomness. Uh, so we have access to a fully random string. Um, and uh, we are allowed, let's say, we need to do this with uh, success probability, which is two thirds. Okay, so this is, uh, this is the formal problem. And uh, let me uh, kind of show how to apply this for similarity search. But kind of what is the general question here is that given a metric, what is the best trade-off we can obtain between S, the number of bits that each of these uh, takes, versus D, the approximation? OK, so this will be the question that we'll be looking at. Uh, so let me show how to apply. So assume that we have an efficient solution to this sketching question for some metric. You, have, you don't care at all about how long it takes to compute the sketch, right? You just, you just mm -hmm. existence. Good question. So here, yeah, we're talking about existence because here we can prove lower bounds because these are communication complexity. One, uh, once we talk about uh, computation time, I mean, it is a valid question, but I, I don't think there is um, any case where we've managed to construct better sketches and where computation was an issue. So, so far it wasn't, but you know, in other cases it may be. So in a sense, you know, there is first order question, second order question. So, okay, so let's see how this implies similarity search. So this is a, a relatively simple theorem. Um, so let me restate just formally what is similarity search. Formally, it's called near neighbor search problem, approximate near neighbor search problem. We're given an endpoint data set P. Um, and uh, we are given, so the data set are all the points except the red one. Uh, when, so we preprocess that uh, point set. Let's say it has endpoints. Uh, we are uh, given a query point Q, this red point, which is guaranteed to be within distance R, this close distance, okay? We, uh, uh, we are required to return any data point within distance DR from Q. So maybe uh, instead of returning exactly this point, we can return any of the yellow points. Okay, so this is the, the problem. And, uh, you know, as for usually for data structures, kind of the trade-off is between, okay, what is the best up for fixed approximation and fixed metric? What is the trade-off between space and the query time? Okay, and here is kind of a simple theorem. It says that suppose we have sketches of size S uh, uh, in the definition from the previous slide, this immediate applies nearest neighbor search, which has space and to order S and query, which, uh, it's not exactly constant time, uh, but it probes the memory, this data structure, in only one location. Okay, so it does some. It takes query, it does some preprocessing on the query, and then decides on one uh, s memory cell to look up, and it goes and looks up that memory cell. Okay, and the proof idea is very simple. Uh, so taking this sketch, which has success probability of two thirds, uh, we can amplify using kind of standard techniques to have failure probability of one over n. To do this, we just take, let's say, order of log n independent sketches and do, let's say, majority vote. Uh, so we take log n copies of each sketch and take majority vote. Okay, so this gives a sketch which has failure probability less than one over n. Okay, so this, so up to this moment, we got a sketch which has very small failure probability, but has sketch size which is s times log n. So this means that um, uh, a sketch, if we take the query and sketch it down to something like order of s log n bits, this is enough to estimate whether it is close or far to every point in the data set. Okay, so we don't need any more information from the query except for this you know, particularly strong sketch, which has s log n bits. So this means that the data structure can prepare for all possible uh, these powerful sketches of a query. In particular, you know, once a sketch is s log n bits, uh, we can prepare for all possible of them. So it, is, it means that two to the power number of possibilities of the sketch. This gives us uh, a space which is n to order s. Okay, 
So this means that there could be n to order s possible sketches of a query, and we can just prepare for all possible uh, sketches of a query. And by the properties, by this failure probability, this is enough to guarantee to uh, to compute the nearest neighbor on the entire data set. Okay. So we just for each sketch, we just prepare the answer. Okay. So in particular, um, you know, and this is one of the motivating uh, kind of regimes for for this talk is. Uh, but fixing, let's say, if we get uh, S to be a constant, if we can sketch, let's say, X and Y into constant number of bits, then uh, we obtain polynomial space and just one cell problem. Okay? Can you do something better than just taking an independent copies? Like, uh, I don't know, expand the law or something? Uh, good question. I, I don't know. Um, what what you can do better if your sketches have additional properties, namely this reconstruction, this reconstruction algorithm, if it has additional property. For example, it is not an arbitrary algorithm, but it is an algorithm that just compares over sketch of x equals to sketch of y. And if it is equal, then it says close. If it is not equal, then it is equal, uh, then it is far. So those kind of sketches lead to what is called locally sensitive hashing, for example. So, so I, I'll actually return to this question much later in the talk. Uh, actually, it's the last slide beyond the uh, going so slightly different direction. So, actually, you can do a little better for this application than uh, S times log n. But it is for different reason, not necessarily because this amplification is done differently. It's because this sketch is not exact actually the right notion for this application. But we'll, we'll get there. OK, so um, okay, so we have uh, polynomial space S for a constant number of bits. OK, so can we construct uh, sketches with constant number of bits? So Johnson Lindenstrauss you know, projects to log n dimensions, uh, and you know, each dimension might require a number of bits to, to compute. So you know, you know, it feels like we should be able to do. So let's just do this kind of directly, as opposed to going through jail. Um, so let's do sketching for you know, the simplest metric, the real line. Okay? Uh, and we are shooting for a constant, um, uh, for constant number of bits. Okay? So let's say we fixed our, uh, the, the threshold to be 1, and the approximation is 1 plus epsilon. So we want to distinguish <coughs> between the distances at most 1 and the distances at least 1 plus epsilon. Okay? So uh, this is what we do. Uh, let's say we take uh, we take the real line and we partition into pieces of length w, which is one plus epsilon by two, which are shifted randomly. Okay, just you know classic random randomly shifted grid, but it's just one dimensional. And let's say what what do we do? So we have different buckets or different intervals. We just color them randomly, either red or blue. Okay. And uh, this color, so for every point, the color will be its sketch. Okay, so we'll obtain a sketch which is, you know, it has just a very small advantage, but has some non-trivial advantage. Okay, so uh, so now let's compute what is the probability. So like, as I mentioned already, the the Charlie will just compare the use the sketches of x and y just by comparing whether they are equal or not. Right? These are just one-bit sketches. So what is the probability that these colors are equal? Um, well, if it is close, then uh, you, know, is, you know we can go through the formulas. But um, there is some probability epsilon by two that they are actually in the same interval. Then the color will be exactly the same. And with, prob with the remaining probability one minus epsilon by two, we are in different intervals. The colors of different intervals are completely independent, so it is probability a half that the colors match. So the total we is half plus something that depends on epsilon. And if the points x and y are far, so they are distance at least 1 plus epsilon, they cannot be in the same piece. So they are in different pieces which have independent colors. So the probability the colors collide is half, precisely. Okay. 
And uh, okay, so now we, we got an algorithm which is one bit sketch, which has some advantage of epsilon by four. So you know you repeat the usual times, repeated order of one epsilon time, take uh, let's say one half plus eight by eight percentile of bits, and uh, this gives us the answer. Okay, so overall what we obtain is uh, gives us the answer with probability let's say two thirds. Right, so we do this just to amplify the probability probability gap to be a constant. And overall, what to obtain is that approximation is 1 plus epsilon, and the sketch size is order of 1 over epsilon squared, exactly how many times we need to repeat. OK? So this is, this is Fourier line. And now, you know, let's, say, let's see how we do sketching for, let's say, LP norms. Right? So let's say for Hamming or for Euclidean space. Um, so for Hamming space, or one, actually, this, is, this was the first sketch, actually. Uh, it was done by Kushilevich, Ostrovsky, Rabani, first sketch of constant size, just be precise. Uh, and what we do is essentially sample bits randomly in the Hamming space. Okay? Um, so for L2, what we can do is reuse this real, uh, this sketch for real line. In particular, uh, we take uh, um, G to be a Gaussian vector, then um, we project uh, the points into, into a line using this vector g. So, uh, and then in this line, we do the real line, um, the sketching for the real line. And the proof that this works, uh, you know, g of x minus g of y is distributed as Gaussian uh, times x minus y. So if you can imagine if x is very close to y, um, then it will remain small with very good probability. If x and y are far, then it will remain far with very good probability. Um, and this reduces to real line case. Just a slightly hang hand waving here, but we can go through the formulas and just see that we get exactly the same answer. And, uh, for, and this can be generalized to any LP for p between 0 and 2. Um, it's also it goes exactly the same, uh, except that instead of taking g to be a Gaussian vector, we take uh, a p-stable distribution. So we pick g to be a p-stable distribution. And uh, this is what Piotr Indyk uh, showed in 2000. Uh, what sorry? Like so p-stable distributions are distributions that have the property that, let's say, um, So fix p. Uh, so suppose we pick g1, g2. Uh, sorry. We pick g, which is a vector g1, gd, where each coordinate, each coordinate is is chosen from this p-stable distribution. Okay, then. For any vector x, we have that x times g is distributed as p norm of x times, let's call this g prime, where this is a one dimensional p stable distribution as well. Okay, so think about, uh, let's say, if g comes from Gaussian. Right, so if we have x times g, then this will be. 2 norm of x times the uh, uh, times another Gaussian. Right, so p-stable distribution is in some sense generalization where we replace this 2 norm of x to p norm of x. And these things exist only for p between 0 and 2. Okay, so for for example, for p equals to 1, this gives uh, the one stable distribution is a Cauchy distribution. OK, and, uh, and this is tight, first of all. Uh, so if we are to fix approximation to be 1 plus epsilon, then sketch has to be around 1 over epsilon squared. Okay. Uh, so for p bigger than 2, sketching LPs is harder. Uh, and this follows from beautiful work by Byros F. Jeram uh, Kumar, Shiva Kumar, as well as uh, by Indek and Woodruff. 
Uh, and uh, if, and, you know, just to say the result, for approximation, for constant approximation, uh, the sketch size, you know, is about uh, d, the dimension, to power 1 minus 2 divided by p. Okay, so for p bigger than 2, this is some polynomial in the dimension. Okay, so kind of this is the goal of the talk is to say, okay, so what, so for which matrix can we really obtain sketches which have constant approximation and constant size? Okay, and you know, we call this super efficient sketching. Um, we remain, I mean, why do we focus on, on this regime? You know, the, the first answer is because we can. Uh, and second answer is that uh, for nearest neighbor search in particular, we care about constant sketches, sketch sizes. Okay. So, so we'll talk about this uh, for the rest. Okay. So, so how how else can we obtain sketches uh, with let's say constant sketch size and constant approximation? Okay. So a classic way to do this for other norms, let's say, or for other metrics, is to do an embedding. In particular, think about this as just a reduction to the cases that we know. In particular, formally, an embedding from, uh, let's say, metric space X to metric space Y uh, is an embedding with distortion C. If for any A and B uh, from the pre-image, we have that the final distance is distorted only by at most a factor of C. Yes. Pictorially, we, it's a function from X to Y, such that for any pair A and B, uh, the, this distance is distorted uh, by uh, at most a factor of C. Okay. So, uh, and this is, you think about this, uh, this is the classic reduction for geometric problems. If we can solve the problem under metric space Y, then this immediately gives us uh, um, a solution for metric, uh, uh, for metric space X. Okay. And uh, in particular, Kind of to apply applying this for sketches, this means that if we have a sketch S uh, for approximation D for the metric space Y, this host space on the right hand side, this immediately implies that we have a sketch of size S and approximation C times D for X for our pre-image. Okay, just immediately. Uh, so, okay, so we can do this, and you know, so what can we do? Um, just to conclude, what we've what we've seen so far. So a metric X admits sketches with constant sketch size and constant approximation if it is an LP space for P at most 2. Right? This is by this P-stable distribution argument. Or if X can embed into LP uh, for P less than 2 with, distortion, with constant distortion. Right? So this is the case that we know how to do directly. And this says like whatever we can reduce to this case, we can do as well. Right? No, no, nothing. Um, Nothing really new. And the motivating question for our work is to ask, are there really any other metrics which have efficient sketches? Right, again, efficient sketches for us means this. OK? I mean, is it, you know, maybe, you know, maybe there is some other technique. Well, as I already suggested. But uh, what we showed that essentially no, at least for norms. OK? So. For norms, if X is a norm, the answer is pretty much this is the best we can do. Okay, so let let me just take the main result. Uh, so consider X, which is uh, a norm space that admits admit sketches of size S and approximation D. Then uh, let's say for any epsilon bigger than zero, uh, X can be embedded into LP for P equals to one minus epsilon, with distortion that depends on the sketch size. Uh, distortion and epsilon. Okay, in particular for constant epsilon, constant sketch size s, constant approximation, this distortion is also constant. You're doing the same thing again. That's, this is not your. You change the definition of embedding. Because l1 minus epsilon is not a metric. Sure. Sure. Okay. So. Right, so we can we can define this without y being a metric necessarily, right? That's uh, and uh, this still holds, and uh, yes, I mean whenever I, I said metric, it can be, uh, it, it doesn't have to be a metric. 
can be just a. Uh, but yes. The terminology I'll embedding has to be. Okay, sure, sure. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> CS yeah. embedding, I don't know how to call it, right? It's a, sorry. Yes. So. Um, can you give so an example uh, <coughs> for something uh, of the second type that is embedded into LP? W that is uh, Im embedded into LP? But not in a, not in uh, a good example. Not what is the question? If something is embeddable into LP. So, for example, if what you. Was the question? If that's not LP, but it's a good example of something that's embeddable. So you can, yeah. So you can take, uh, for example, a negative type metric, which is lives in L two squared. Like for example, Heisenberg group, uh, and uh, so it embeds in L two squared. Or if you take its root of that metric, it embeds into L two. So it's a non-trivial metric. I guess Asaf can say much more about it than <laughs> I can, but this is an example of a non-trivial metric. Now, are there kind of metrics that appear from applications that are that have constant distortion embedding into LPs? M not really. In a sense, we are not they are not sufficiently different from LPs. But if you are embedding, let's say, with constant distortion, then you know, they are pretty much an LP space. So there are very few. Uh, metrics, uh, okay, Heisenberg group, and I mostly are the counter examples for uh, for Goman's conjecture. The general answer is essentially nothing embedding to LP. Because being embedding to LP is very restrictive, so you should view this theorem as for norms, hardly any norm is sketchable. Yeah. That's a, that's a, it's very, very rare. Okay, so just to uh, you know, just to contextualize this, so you know, these two notions, embedding into LP for P at most two, and so just to return to Asaf's uh, point earlier, so for P less than for P which is less than one, LP is formally not a metric; it doesn't satisfy triangle inequality, but a lot of these things can still be. Uh, said about LPs. In particular, the sketching, we can still sketch LP for P less than 1. Right? Exactly the same definition, we don't, we don't really require triangle inequality for definitions. Um, okay, so, um, all right, so this is, so in a sense, if we were, uh, if a norm is embeddable into LP, uh, then it implies efficient sketches. This essentially was proven by Kuchlev, Jasovsky, Rabani, and by uh, Piotr Indyk. Uh, uh, so we show the inverse direction, showing that these two notions are equivalent. Okay, for norms. Okay, so um, okay, I, I want to see here what is a norm. Um, but one application, mm, one concrete application is, you know. This means that if we can prove that uh, there are no embeddings with distortion, constant distortion into L1 minus epsilon, this means that there are no sketches of size and approximation, which is a constant. OK, so just immediate corollary, uh, taking the contrapositive. And uh, this means that we can convert on embeddability into lower bounds for sketches in a black box way. OK? Um, and uh, just you know, an asterisk here, when we prove the lower bound for sketches here, we actually prove a lower bound for two-way communication. So it is not just the simultaneous uh, protocol okay, for, for experts in the audience. And, uh, and just to ap apply this kind of the, the contrapositive to show this uh, immediate corollary applied to particular metrics, this actually gave us new results. And in part, I mean, part of our work was motivated by trying to prove sketching lower bounds for f over distance. So this was, in a sense, a more general result. Right? So if you cannot do a simpler question, you generalize it, and then you solve it. Right? Um, OK, so what is f over distance? Uh, so let's say f over distance uh, is uh, the following. So suppose we have x, which assigns a real number to every point in a, in a two-dimensional grid. Uh, let's say it's delta by delta. It's a discrete uh, grid. Uh, we assign a real number, and we say that suppose we have uh, these real numbers have zero average, so there is a positive mass and negative mass, and uh, we define the EMD norm of X 
is the cost of the best transportation uh, of the positive part to the negative part. Or put differently, this is the minimum, uh, minimum cost matching by partite matching between the positive part and the negative part. Okay? In, uh, in, in, sorry, in computer science, this is, uh, in computer science, it's called F mover distance. Uh, in math, usually, it's called either transportation or Wasserstein metric. And, um, and in computer science, you can think about this as a measure between two images, of the similarity between two images. So it is just how much do I have to move a little bit the points from one image to the other image so, uh, so that they become the same. Okay, and this is solved kind of by, um, by chromatic uh, mean cost matching. Okay, so this is what transportation means. Uh, and, uh, and this kind of doing algorithms under F mover distance has been an open problem for, for a while. And in particular, you know, problems like nearest neighbor search, even computation, um, computing it fast was an open problem for a while. Um, and uh, in particular for sketching, the best approximation that we have for, uh, for sketching was to obtain a D approximation with space, which is uh, n to order of 1 over d. OK? Um, so there are a, a number of results uh, in this direction, uh, including myself. Um, and we don't know how to do better. And there is a big question whether you know, can this be done better. Uh, there are no lower bounds prior to this work. Um, and what we, uh, you know, applying a f our theorem uh, to a theorem uh, that was proved by Asaf and Gideon Schechman, uh, who proved back in 2005 that there is no embedding of EMD into L1 uh, minus epsilon with constant distortion. This is what the theorem says. So just applying immediately our corollary, this means that there is no sketches with constant approximation and constant size for F over distance. Okay. So and just uh, to say immediately, we don't have any quantitative bounds here. Uh, so this is the best that we can say at the moment. Okay. Uh, and this connects back to the minimum cost matching metric uh, to the MD as it defined in computer science. This is a slightly different notion. So the lower bound is proven for for EMD norm, but this connects back to the EMD distance as we know it in computer science. So don't worry about it. Is there that. some kind of quantitative version of your theorem? N here, no. For, uh, for the original for the theorem, theorem, yes. Yeah. yeah. So the distortion becomes order S times D divided by epsilon. But for not for the EMD uh, uh, Because this theorem is non quantitative. I, 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 think, I think it's mechanical. It Probably, yeah. Kinds of several papers that, you know, analysis is a black box that you were not written as in quantitative form and you're going to have to take a deep breath and you do the whole thing. In, in yeah. I, I, I don't see any reason in those papers that they won't be, that they're not quantitative with a lot of work, but you have to really want it. That's it. Yeah. Okay, and another example is the trace norm. So for a matrix, uh, an n by n matrix, uh, trace norm is just the sum of the absolute values of the, sing of, uh, of the singular values. And uh, so previously, so this has been studied before our work. Uh, there are lower bounds, <coughs> but mostly there are for certain restricted classes of sketches, for linear sketches to be precise, um, by Lin, Guyan, and Udruf. And uh, uh, so applying our theorem together with result by uh, Pizier from 78, who showed that there is uh, any embedding into L1 of the trace norm requires root n distortion. Uh, this uh, immediately applies that any sketch must satisfy uh, that sketch size times distortion is uh, omega of root n divided by log n. This log n appears because we have to switch from L1 minus epsilon to L1, but that's you know kind of the usual thing that we take epsilon to be 1 over log n, and then it's very close to L1. Okay, and uh, uh, just l after our work, we, there is a more recent paper that shows that for approximation, which is one plus epsilon, this improves upon our result. Uh, this requires sketch size, which is n to something very close to n, which depends on epsilon. So this is an interesting result for epsilons, which are very small. 
Okay? But still, this is another problem where there is a big gap between upper bound and lower bound. So getting, for example, constant approximation, the best upper bound is still order of n squared for this norm. We don't know anything non-trivial here. Okay, so, so these were kind of the, the con contextualization. So let me go through the sketch of the proof. So we want, sorry? It's possible to give a sketch, that was stupid. <laughs> <laughs> is, is it oh, is it possible? Yes, possible. right, 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 right. Yes, yes. It's <laughs> constant size. <laughs> right. it's, uh, <laughs> it's produced by a finite state automaton, hence it's <laughs> like finite size. So, um, okay. So here, here is how we proof uh, this sketch. Yeah, uh, fine. <laughs> um, a simplified version of the proof right, goes. So, uh, so it uses uh, uh, a few our theorems, and probably we spend more time about talking what our theorems we are using than actually kind of going for actual proof. Uh, but here is the <laughs> outline. Okay, so there are a few steps. So we start by assuming. So we have X, right, this norm, and we're saying that if it has good sketches, then it is embeddable into L uh, one minus epsilon. Okay, so suppose it has good sketches. You know, constant distortion, constant approximation. Uh, so the first thing that we do is uh, we switch to good sketches for uh, L infinity of x. So L infinity of x is, uh, th think about as the, uh, taking some kind of uh, tensor of, the, of x. Uh, so instead of, and this is k-dimensional L infinity of x, it will be a new metric uh, where the underlying space is uh, X, uh, x to the k, so it's k-dimensional vectors where each entry is uh, an element from x. And we define the norm of this uh, new space to be L infinity uh, over x. So this means we compute the norm of each of these coordinates and then take the maximal value. So basically it's L infinity product of x. Okay. Uh, and uh, for constant for constant approximation, constant sketch, this k will be constant as well, actually. K is constant, yeah? K is constant. In general, it will be dependent on the sketch size. Uh, we'll, we'll get uh, to that in a second, actually. OK. Um, so here is where, and the main reason we switch to this is because we can use a theorem that we proved uh, a while ago with uh, Jerem and uh, Patrashko. Uh, which is a direct sum for information complexity, uses uh, BGKS uh, kind of underlying. And what it proves is that, um, okay, it, it proves a contrapositive that certain Poincare type inequalities, and I'll talk about them a little bit later, imply that there is no sketches. Or kind of, uh, in this direction, it means that no uh, good sketches implies that absence of cent uh, certain Poincare type inequalities. And Poincare type inequalities are usually certain kind of inequalities that are proved, uh, used to prove non evadability into LP spaces, for example. Um, and oftentimes, they are, uh, they are characterizing embeddability. So an embedding exi exists if and only if there is no Poincare type inequality. Okay. So there is a certain kind of Poincare type inequality that characterizes this. Okay. So from here, basically using convex duality and compactness, uh, the absence of certain pon of, of those Poincare type inequalities implies that there is a very weak embedding of, a, of X into L2. Okay. So here we start getting some kind of embeddings. This weak embedding has the following properties. Uh, for two, prop for two uh, points, x1, x2, if their distance is less than 1, okay, then the, uh, the image will be less than 1 as well. Right, so this is in norm x, this is now 2 norm, if I don't write it. And if these uh, points are sufficiently far, uh, then the, if their image is also far. Okay, so this is kind of very weak, the minimal thing you can ask for in, for one scale. Up to now, you're not using the norm, right? Or at what point are you using the Here's the first the time. Side, here's the first time we use the norm. Even even the first one? Yeah, to, just to get here, yeah. To, to prove that good sketches for x implies good sketches for L infinity of x. You use the norm? Yeah. It's not for metrics? Sorry? You cannot do this. Uh, we we don't know how to do it. No, we, we do like, so the sketches, 
how do we how do we construct the sketches for an infinity of x? We take Rademacher variables, we sum them up, and we sketch. Uh, um, no, okay. no, can you think of x as a subspace over infinity and then just for this space? So. I, I don't know. So I in a sense, we, we need to construct, this takes a different input kind of the sketches. So we need to construct new functions. We cannot just plug in. So, uh, so I mean, this, this has different dimensionality, kind of, right? These are functions mapping from, say, d dimensional space. These are functions that map from k d dimensional space. Um, maybe, I don't know. It's uh, OK. So the next step is uh, to, uh, to make this weak embedding into something stronger, uh, which is called uniform embedding. Uh, uniform embedding is. Uh, it, it essentially has kind of more scales, it's, uh, and it has the following property that the distance is kind of a very w okay, still weak form of embedding, but you know, it, um, okay, it has the following properties that the the image, the distance in the image, is upper bounded by some function of the distance called u, uh, and some other function called l of the original thing. So by Lipschitz embedding, this uh, would mean that u and l are linear, for example. Uh, so uniform embedding means that u and l are, you know, can be anything, but we have to satisfy some properties so that this actually makes sense. Uh, in particular, l and u are non-decreasing, and uh, l of t has, to, has to be always bigger than 0, and u of t has to go to 0 as t goes to 0, as its argument goes to 0. OK, so this is kind of some reasonable embedding. So, and uh, this uses uh, some steps that uh, were inspired by a uh, paper by Johnson and Randre Narivoni uh, from 2006, um, plus some Lipschitz extension. Uh, we'll see some of these steps, actually. And the last step is to use, essentially, the argument of Ahronia Mori Mityagin from 85 uh, to get uh, a linear embedding of x into L1 and S epsilon. OK. So this is, this is the setup. Uh, I'll give some kind of overview of each of the step next. OK. Uh, so not necessarily going through all the calculations, but at least like what are these different theorems or different, uh, different tools that we are using. OK. So first of all, let me uh, do, uh, show you a non-solution. So this is n not an actual step. Uh, but there is an almost shortcut that, um, you know, honestly, for a while we thought that this is what we are going to use. Uh, so this is bypassing this going from x to infinity of x and then using this theorem. Um, so somehow going directly into this embedding. Uh, and uh, here how it goes. Um, so this is uh, something, I mean, we used a form of this step in a previous paper with Robbie Krogamer when uh, proving sketching lower bounds for eddy distance. Uh, and this is what, uh, uh, what we showed there, is uh, to say, OK, uh, so assuming good sketches. Again, good sketches means that we have sketch of size s with constant uh, probability of success. Uh, so this means, so what we can do, and you know, pretty simple argument, is to get a one-bit sketch, which has a success probability just a little bit over a half. OK, it decays exponentially fast in the sketch size. It's uh, 1 plus 2 to minus s. Um, but you get something. OK? So then you can argue about 1D sketches and so forth. Um, and we can just use this directly to obtain this kind of embedding. In particular, uh, the sketch is uh, a randomized function. Uh, so in, kind of in the sketching uh, terminology, it's a randomized function of prime that depends on this public randomness that maps the norm into 0, 1. Um, such that if the distance uh, of x1 and x2 is small, then uh, the expected, uh, let's say, uh, l1 or l2 distance between this is small by something. It's less than half minus 2 to minus s. And if this distance is large, then the expected distance is at least uh, half plus 2 to minus s. OK, this is 
pretty much just rewriting what the sketching means. Okay, this, think about this. This is the protocol that Charlie is, is running. Right? So the expectation is just counts what is the probability of success of Charlie. Okay, so now you can just take these, uh, so having this randomized F prime, okay, so we have some public randomness, it is over some random bits, we can just enumerate, we can take F, uh, which has many coordinates, uh, and uh, for each coordinate we just write the probability that we choose that random bit string uh, times what uh, the F prime of the, uh, uh, of the input for that random bit string. So we just write out all the randomness on all the coordinates, to put differently. Okay, just to transform an expectation into L2 norm. Okay, this should actually not be a norm, this should be just an absolute value. Um, since these are one dimensional. Okay, so this, this is, you know, this is what can we can obtain. And uh, then we will, the main problem why this is an almost shortcut, but not an actual shortcut, is that the type of bounds numbers that we get here is something like half minus 2 to minus s versus half plus 2 to minus s. Whereas the gap that we'll need here in the later steps needs to be about that. Okay, the actual gap that we need here is 8, not 10. Uh, but still, kind of for sketch size, which is still some constant, this gap that we obtain here is not good enough for the later steps. So you can think about this AGP theorem as taking tensor product in a sense. Right, so there is, uh, exactly, somehow, you know, it, it feels slightly technical kind of, right? You now applying that uh, our theorem is the only thing, the only way we know how to deal with it at the moment. I mean, may maybe there should be a more direct proof about. In L2 if you take a tensor product, mm -hmm. what happens? Tensor, um, so you have the dot products so go down, right? One made, a zero one vector, so the dot, dot products go down, this means that the distance is, you cannot amplify a gap, right? So once you get an embedding and the gap is small, you cannot amplify a gap. You cannot, you, you cannot stretch the metric, right, without breaking something else. Right, you, you cannot, like if you, if somehow at larger distances you're stretching the metric, this means that some smaller distances have also to have to be stretched. So once you obtain this, for example here, from here to here it is, uh, I mean I don't think you can go from here to here. It is just that you have to argue at the beginning somehow. And note that in a sense, okay, so here is another thing that <coughs> we have to you lose the S somewhere. So there is sketch size S. We have to lose it somewhere because a sketch becomes larger and larger. At some moment, you know, something has got to give here. Okay, and it has to come into this approximation. Okay, so let me let me show you the actual reduction. Um, again, I mean, m maybe it is you know not the right way to do it, but at the moment this is the only w way we know how to do it. Mm, okay, so <coughs> so this is the claim, and this is I mean, this is this step. Uh, this uses the fact that X is a norm, um, and it says the following. So suppose we have an S-bit sketch for X an approximation D, we can get a sketch for the k-dimensional infinity of x, still with the same sketch size, so this does not increase the sketch size, uh, but uh, the k goes into the approximation. So the approximation goes up. So in a sense, uh, we are sketching, assuming we can sketch x, we can sketch a harder space, right? It's an infinity of k of x, and where do we lose? We're losing the approximation. And here is the proof idea. 
So, so we are designing the sketch for these infinity of x. Let's let x1 up to xk and let's say y, y1 up to yk be the two inputs of Alice and Bob. Uh, so the sketch is the following. So we'll use Radiomacher variables, namely sigma i's, which are plus minus ones. Okay. We compute Alice computes this sum, this random sum of x i's with uh, random plus minus ones, and Bob computes uh, this random uh, sum of yi uh, times sigma i, okay? And we sketch this, and we use that. Uh, so we sketch this, we plug into the sketch for x, and we use this, the answer as an answer for L infinity of x, okay? And in particular, here is uh, the two properties that we need. Uh, one is that, um, so uh, the distance between these, some random summation and this random summation stays large, so it is at least L infinity of um, so it's maximum over i. Uh, it's, it stays large with probability at least a half. Okay, so the distance. I mean, it has, you can think about this as kind of some kind of randomized mapping from L infinity of x to x, and we're saying that well, how do we obtain uh, something from x, we just you know sum up all the coordinates uh, with random signs, and they're saying these two vectors uh, are lower bounded by the L infinity of x distance between those two vectors with probability at least a half. Okay, and uh, kind of more obvious statement is to say, uh, well, and obviously the the distance in these uh, random summations is at most k times the maximum just by triangle inequality. This is this is where we use triangle inequality, no, in and here as well, yeah. Not if it's small, it's split the i with minus and sum the average of the two things with this. Yeah. This is that. So this is uh, this is where we use norm in this first section. Yes. So one thing that I'm just noticing now is because of your theorem. Mm -hmm. You can replace the first thing, the maximum, by the sum of the square square root. Because you, if you use your theorem, mm -hmm. then the thing is in L1 minus section, so it says co type 2. Okay. And then exactly this, uh, this rather much sum is at least the sum of the squares, square root. Uh -huh. So this is, if, if, if you can, somehow you can bootstrap your theorem for the f in the first line to get the lower bound in the L2 sum instead of a maximum. But then we have to talk about L2. L2 of x, you mean, or? Well, no, because the upper bound is still k times. Uh, I see. Um, so, but you have some mixed thing, which is, you, you can improve the lower bound significantly because of your theorem. This is he, he, here, you mean? Oh, I see. Yeah. I see what you mean. So that could be useful for something. I see. Okay. Your theorem is already telling you that you're improving it. <laughs> okay. Okay. So let's. Okay. Yeah. I have to think. It's using your theorem in your proof, so it's kind of. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, not at the same time, right? It's like, no, no, <laughs> no, 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 no I'm just kidding. Right? 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 No, I understand. And then it says, okay, but now I can use this fact. You know, this back into the proof and get some a better estimate. Yeah. No, I understand. I understand. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay. So this is uh, so this is this first reduction, and let me go uh, to the second reduction. Okay. So we keep this claim. Now, what uh, this theorem, uh, this AGP theorem says. So I informally, this is, I mean, it's just a direct sum kind of question. It says that if uh, L infinity, k-dimensional <coughs> infinity of x admits a sketch of size s, this means that uh, x itself must have a sketch of size order of s divided by k. OK, so this is kind of a classic direct sum kind of theorem. OK, um, so in a sense, we will, uh, we will use this. Uh, We'll use this statement. And um, kind of more formally, this is just informally. So more formally, what AGP theorem says, you know, it has to imply certain kind of Poincare type inequalities. This is the type of Poincare inequality that it actually implies. So it says that if um, y y you can think about, I mean, 
what will be the parameters kind of going back to this line so like well we'll set k to be equal to uh, k to be equal to s so this means that we started with x that has a pro that has sketch s right we switch to an infinity of x which still has the same sketch size but the approximation went up and then using this theorem we're basically saying well now uh, we can use this for k equals to s and this actually implies that x has a sketch size which is constant now independent of the original parameters uh, the approximation is well d times s so this is what it informally and once we're saying like well now x has a very small sketch size this means that it's very nice so, you know we can think of getting this as to be one bit and applying kind of the the theorem that we had before uh, with Robbie Krautgamer from 2007. Uh, but we need a little bit more uh, somehow that still is not enough. Even in some sense, think about this as, you know, so far what we've done, we've reduced the sketch size of x, of x while increasing the approximation. So at least, you know, going back to this uh, almost shortcut, at least we can make sure that this s becomes a constant here uh, increasing this approximation. So we, we switch from the approximation, from the sketch size S from here into here. At least we can do directly right, with AGP. But what we, n I mean, this is still not enough because that gap still is some small constant as opposed to the factor eight that we actually need. Um, so coming back, so the actual Poincaré type inequality says, OK, there, there exist no distributions, uh, mu1, which is supported on closed pairs, so uh, pairs of points which are distance 1, and mu2, which is supported on far pairs, uh, pairs of points are ch which are distance omega sd. So all this should be omega sd as well, but I'll just drop omega for simplicity of notation. Um, such that for any function which maps the norm into the uh, uh, into the unit ball uh, in L2, such that um, the expected squared distance in the image when we take uh, pairs of closed uh, points uh, is upper bounded by some constant factor uh, times the expected square distance over the far points. Uh, and again, there is some, an, another fudge parameter 0.1. So in fact, it implies, no, what implies? What is the assumption? Uh, this claim. The first, not the second, OK. This, this claim, yeah. So okay. in, in fact, the implication is by AGP. No, no, but it's not that you're not assuming that L infinity k has, a, it's just that x Okay, the, the, the initial no. assumption. So this claim, this claim, sorry, yeah, so this, yeah, we don't need the middle. Thi this is AGP, yeah, this is just informal statement. Yeah. Okay, uh, before throwing in kind of a. But so the in fact means. The in fact, yeah, the in fact means that this claim implies that there are no distributions. And this in fact is by AGP. So this is a formal, the formal way we use AGP theorem. Okay, so. Um, so anyways, you know, I want to show you after this kind of that there is, exists no distributions, you can uh, apply convex duality and compactness to get that there is uh, there exists a weak embedding which satisfies these properties. Okay, this uh, hundred is related to this ten. Okay. Um, so this part is relatively mechanical, so I'm not sure. OK, so all right. So what we've gotten so far is this weak embedding, okay, which has the following properties. And now we want to go from weak embedding into what we call uniform embedding, uh, namely the embedding where uh, this image, the distance in the image, is uh, upper bounded by some function of the distance and lower bounded by some other function, the lower bound function of the distance, satisfying some uh, some properties. Uh, and uh, you know the question is how to how to do this, and uh, you know just to kind of suggest that this is a non-immediate step. Um, note that f can 
it can be pretty wild function here. It can be very far from being continuous. Uh, it may not be injective. It, uh, uh, so there could be big jumps there, for example. And also, it doesn't uh, guarantee what happens you know, for distances which are much larger, for example. So, um, so here is here is what we do, and this is again uh, following the uh, a similar proof by Justin uh, and Randra Narino, uh, uh, Randrea Narivoni. Um, so here is how it goes. So let n be a one net of x. Okay, so this is a subset of points in the norm x which are distance at least one, and such that any other point is within distance one of this net n. Um, let's say f hat is the function that uh, is the function f which is fixed on the net point n. Okay, so f hat is defined only on n now. Uh, so just uh, okay, I, I won't prove it, but uh, it's relatively easy to prove that f hat is Lipschitz on this n. So this means that if for you know, what do we have? Kind of, so Lipschitz means proving an upper bound. So we'd be using this kind of statement. Well, so here it says that, you know, it, it's Lipschitz on one scale only. It says that, well, if the original distance was at most one, then the target distance is at most one. Well, by essentially by triangle inequality, you can prove that if the distance was at most t, then the final distance is also at most t. Okay? <coughs> it's to be a little bit careful, but pretty much this is uh, easy to prove. Uh, and now we take the following. Uh, we take uh, g hat, uh, which is called half holder of f hat. Uh, this is basically taking the, uh, this factor 2 is because this Lipschitz is with constant 2. Uh, so it is just takes these distances in f hat and raises to power half. And this is, this is possible by classic theorem by Schoenberg. OK? And uh, the main reason we are doing this is to apply this uh, next theorem. Uh, and this is an extension theorem uh, by Minty. Uh, it says that if we, so under these conditions, you know, from whatever we have so far, this g hat can be extended to the entire norm x that satisfies this inequality for the entire, uh, for the entire x now. OK, so, so far, so what did we do? We took f, we looked only on the net. Because in the sense, on the net is where the reasonable things can be extracted from this function f. Right? Roughly, distance scale 1 is where the reasonable things are happening. Uh, so we take g hat, which is half holder, mostly just to, apply this, to be able to apply this uh, theorem. And then we just extend this g hat to the entire space. And the extension now begins to have more nice properties. In particular, uh, it is. Um, it is ellipses at all scales, for example. OK? Now, uh, once it is, uh, so this immediately gives the upper bound function. So this u is actually root of, uh, uh, of its argument. And uh, actually, we can obtain, so the lower bound can be obtained as, as well. Uh, in particular, the lower bound is minimum between 1 and the argument divided by sd. OK, so it says that the argument here can be divided by a factor of SD. Um, and uh, to prove this, I mean, in fact, you know, the main part that we need is the second part is A divided by SD, this lower bound. Uh, and uh, this is just using the <coughs> Lipschitz property. And this is where this factor 10 actually uh, comes in. Um, namely, so how do, we, how do we prove this? Let me just draw a picture. Uh, so we have this uh, point x, x1. We have this point x2. We think about them as being uh, very far. So these points are a distance at least uh, sd. Actually, it should be a little bit more than sd, SD plus 2, I think. Okay, let me just. Uh, that's four actually. Uh, 
we, we should be also as D plus four, in fact. Um, but again, so uh, so we have this. Now what we do is the following: so we we snap this to the closest net point, right? So this is let's call this is uh, x n one. Uh, this is x two n. Okay, we snap. So we know that this distance is at most one. This distance is at most one. We know that by triangle inequality, this distance is at least uh, is at least s times d. Okay. Um, plus two is enough. So this means that. Um, now that g, so g hat of x1 minus g hat of x, x2 <coughs> is um, at least g hat of x1n minus g hat of x2n minus this distance right, and uh, this distance is at most so this distance in the original metric is at most one by this upper bound by this upper bound it means that this image is at most root two so this is minus root two right so this is minus this distance and again minus this distance in the image and this is exactly by the same argument is another minus root two Okay, now this part, you say this is at most, um, sorry, this is at least. Now we're applying this statement, right? So we had that this is, um, right, these two points, x1n and x2n, are sufficiently far so that we can apply this property. So we are net points. Right, and whatever where the net points, where distances were preserved for all these uh, transformations, right? So we were at big distance, so this means that, um, you know, modulo of this part, uh, I think that, sorry, uh, I copied wrong, but it shouldn't be two. Um, and it is at least, uh, so the image is at least 10. So g is actually root of the function f. So it should be root of 10 minus 2 root 2. And this is bigger than 0. So this is. This is, there is no two here, but uh, okay. What is when a goes to zero? You don't need it. Right. So when uh, a goes to zero, this is where you use another metric uh, property. You. So you have x1, you have x2, right? they are very close. So what you do, you take this vector, let's call this v, repeat it many times. This will be v, this will be v, this will be v, and so forth. Until, and this will be some xk, until this distance is now more than s d plus 2. Yeah, yeah. So you, you, we we do use equivariance as okay, well. Because otherwise it won't. Yes, yeah, of course, of course, of course. Yeah, uh, yeah. I, I'm skipping this step a little bit, and yes, I mean there are. So you're absolutely right. Yeah, okay. Right. Yeah. <coughs> okay. So, anyway, uh, I'm showing this uh, proof in more detail, uh, exactly because <coughs> to show you that we need a factor eight here, basically for this gap. This is why we had to go all through, you know, this first step. Um, okay, so uh, sorry, uh, just to 
finish. So what we obtain is a uniform embedding of our norm into L2 uh, with certain uh, uh, functions, U and L. And just to repeat them here, these are the functions U and L that uh, we obtain. In particular, the image, the distance in the image is at most the uh, root of two times the original norm. And if uh, this uh, distance is at least one, sorry, this, uh, the, the distance in the image is at least one if the original distance is, was at least. Can prove is that sketch size times approximation is bigger than something. Right? It does not it's not necessarily that this kind of parameterization is the right one. Right? For other um, for other metrics it could be different. Um, for example, for uh, just for trace norm, what we proved is that this is bigger than root n. Uh, whereas you know it it looks like the but for d, which is a constant, the sketch size should be at least n. We don't know, actually, if it is n or n squared, but or in between. Uh, but it looks like of this form. So it cannot, just cannot come from these kind of arguments. Um, OK. Uh, and the other kind of related question was, is uh, to argue about linear sketches. So where the measurements, where we think about sketch not as bits, but actually dot products of x with, uh, with some, some random variable. Um, so talk about linear sketches, where we can think about a number of measurements, how many linear sketches we have, what is the approximation, and so forth. That seems like a much easier question. Uh, yes, that's what we started with. But we proved, I think, we had a lower bound for one measurement or something like that. It's, it seems a little harder for f more measurements, but maybe you can prove more also. OK, so and uh, actually coming back to the question asked in the beginning, kind of what is, I mean, what does it mean for nearest neighbor search? Um, <coughs> so let me kind of come back to this theorem that we said that, OK, we have a sketch of size s, which works with constant approximation. This means that we have nearest neighbor search with uh, n to order s space and one query, OK? So, uh, so the right kind of communication problem to look at is uh, for this problem is the following. We, uh, Alice has one string, uh, one point x in our uh, metric space. And Bob has n of this, okay, called y1 up to yn in, uh, in this metric space. And the problem is uh, to answer yes, if there exists uh, yi, which is close to x, uh, or say no if all of them are far away. But I, and again, it's the, the gap is as we defined for sketching, namely, you know, does there exist a yi, yi such that the distance between x minus y norm is at most r, versus for any yi we have x minus y is at least d times r. r. Okay, so this is, and we can think about this as a communication problem. Uh, and uh, in terms of kind of restating this uh, theorem in this communication kind of problem language, it says that uh, what really it said that for if we have a sketch size s, s for this, let's say, norm x for, uh, for whatever metric we're doing it, there is a norm x here, um, then there is a one-way protocol with order s log n uh, bits to solve this problem. In particular, you take the sketch, you amplify it, uh, repeat it log n times, get a uh, high probability statement, and just send the sketch, sketch from Alice to Bob, and uh, Bob can decide on, the, on this problem. OK? So the question is our direction. Is this kind of the most optimal protocol? And uh, the answer is that uh, it does not seem to be the case. OK? We don't fully understand what's the situation here. Um, but just to give you kind of one nugget here, uh, and I guess I'll let Ilya say more about this a few weeks from now. Uh, so let's consider the d-dimensional L-infinity uh, case. So for d-dimensional infinity, the standard theorem uh, 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 by Bar Yosef, Jerem, Kumar, Shiva, Kumar, uh, is that for approximation, for alpha approximation, the sketch size is d divided by alpha squared. Okay. 
Uh, and you can think about you know, what is the relation between D and N, just to give you some point of reference. You can think about D as being equals to log squared N, let's see. Okay, so so it, it you know it sorry um, what do you want to say? Uh, it it looks like kind of if we are to apply this, then you know sketch size uh, so d times alpha squared. So d if it's at least log squared n for let's say constant approximation, uh, even solving. You know, if, if even if n is equal to one, we already have approximation. Okay, if we are just to compare the distance between x and y one, then the sketch size is already something like uh, s, which is log squared n. So even without this log n factor, it becomes <coughs> the, the amount of bits that Alice has to send to Bob is more than uh, logarithmic. Okay, so. So just to step back, uh, right, so kind of looking at the theorem, uh, we would like Alice to send only logarithmic number of bits. This corresponds to polynomial space for nearest neighbor search. Okay, and here we said, okay, if we, if we started with sketch size which is constant, then we got a log n uh, bit protocol, and this gives us a polynomial uh, space algorithm. Okay. So for L infinity, this begins. This looks like a non-starter. Even if we are to compare x, let's say, to the first string to y1, it looks like the sketch size is omega of d by alpha squared. So for constant approximation, this means that Alice already has to send at least omega d bits. And if d is, let's say, log squared n, this is already super polynomial space. Okay, and your approximation already has basically has to be polynomial in the dimension to, to get something, right? To, if we are to apply this theorem directly, uh, even, even if it were to be S plus log n, okay? Um, when we would need something like D divided by alpha squared to be equal to, let's say, log n, this means that alpha would be equal to root log n in this situation. Uh, Yeah, um, boot log n, yeah. D to a quarter. Okay, so this is, uh, sorry, just coming back to your question. Even if we, if we manage to obtain S plus log n here, okay? But for this problem, it turns out that you can do different things. And in particular, so for one way, I actually don't know what is the right, uh, the right answer. Uh, but for nearest neighbor search, you can actually do a two-way communication protocol where Alice sends a number of bits. It's still kind of logarithmic. Bob uh, sends, also sends a number of bits, but much less than n. Um, and in particular, this was a result by uh, Piotr Inding and ITA, uh, that you can obtain a protocol. I mean, okay, it was in different language, but from it, you can extract a protocol uh, where Alice sends order log n bits, Bob sends back something like d log n to constant, so it's still polylogarithmic in n number of bits, and approximation is doubly logarithmic in, dim in uh, dimension d. Okay, so at least if we allow Bob to communicate a little bit of information back to Alice, we can get vast improvements. Okay, and it turns out that this uh, basically these trade-offs with uh, log log d approximation is tied at least for this uh, communication. Okay, so the notion that uh, kind of to be applied, the notion of sketching or uh, to be applied in for this communication problem seems to be different. It's not the standard sketching is defined here. Okay, and uh, so I, I presume Ilya will talk actually about this. So um, this is where I wanted to end the talk. Um, maybe I'll just mention that the, the main property that seems to characterize this is uh, what we what is called robust expansion. This was something that was introduced in a paper by Panigrahi, Alvaro, and Didier back in 2010. 
as far as we understand the problem, the moment it characterizes uh, the nearest neighbor search for a metric. So it's a property of a metric, and it seems to characterize uh, how well can we solve this communication problem and nearest neighbor search as well. Okay, I'll, I'll finish here. Thank you.